Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Weekly Linux News for the 10th of September 2017. I mentioned in my previous video that I had dropped KD Neon and gone to Kubuntu 17.10 Beta instead. After a little while of messing around with it, I actually decided to go back to KD Neon. I probably will switch to Kubuntu 17.10 when it's formally released, but it's going to become a bit of effort messing around with various repositories that I have added to my system because I would have had to switch them to the 1704 version manually and then gone back to 1710 upon formal release. It didn't really do me much good because I was trying to get the Falcon web browser working, but well, it doesn't work in 1710, but I see it worked perfectly in 1604, but not for me because I use a non standard kernel. Anyway, onwards with the news, and talking about kernels, Linux 4.13 has been released. And poor old Linus, he was suffering from kidney stones, so he spent seven hours trying to pass penguin-shaped kidney stones. Now it doesn't say penguin-shaped, I've just uh, added that bit on for amusement, but hey, maybe they were. Or maybe they were windows-shaped kidney stones. Oh, either way though, poor guy. I hope he's recovered now, and uh, Linux development will continue, so... So what is the major change here? So we don't have the full change log because that's just going to be enormous, but it does mention about SMB1 being dropped. So the default now for SMB mounts is version 3. So yeah, that's um, it's a sensible choice really because SMB1 is deprecated, well out of date, is quite a high security risk to use now, especially in Windows world. So we might as well replicate that with Samba in Linux. From its FOSS, Desktop Linux now has its highest market share ever. Funny, I think this is like the third time this year I've said this now, but okay, the highest market share ever. And what statistics are these from? So, so on net market share, we now have 3.37% for the Linux market. So it's been a progressive rise up through the year, so in May it was 1.99, July 2.53, and August up to 3.37. And there is a mention here that Chromebooks have helped the market share. Yeah, it's fair enough, because some statistics I've seen show that Chrome OS usage pretty much dwarfs all the other Linux OS's usage. Oh, with the exception of Android. Let's exclude that one entirely. <laughs> yeah, Android has its own statistic on most of these market shares. This factor might be as students preparing to go to college may have boosted Chromebook sales. Interesting, yeah, they're probably cheaper than a Windows laptop. From Softpedia, Debian, oh, GNU Linux this time. So Debian 10, which is codenamed Buster, enters the alpha stage development, and it now has the Linux 4.12 kernel, yeah, just as 4.13 is released. So on the hardware improvement side of things, the Debian installer adds a database entries for various single board computers. The Grub installer now supports JBOD systems that have a large number of disk drives, that is, just a bunch of disks. And yeah, that looks about all the notable features so far. Also from Softpedia, Mesa 17.2 graphics stack released brings many improvements for Linux gamers. The Mesa graphics stack includes open source drivers for AMD, Intel, and the Novu graphics drivers for NVIDIA cards, but not the proprietary NVIDIA drivers. So the highlights of the Mesa 17.2 graphics stack includes performance improvements for both Intel ANV and AMD RADV Vulkan drivers, implementation of the OpenGL 4.5 API, numerous bugs are addressed, improving support for many popular games. Among these, they can mention that uh, Europa Universalis 4, The Witcher 2, Assassins of Kings, Doom 2016, the Wine version, Total War Warhammer, and Serious Sam Fusion. Google Earth and Chromium Maps also received improvements as well as the Wayland Display Server. From the register, Toshiba bods say 14 terabyte helium filled disk drive is coming soon. Hmm, 14 terabytes. How much stuff can you put on one of those? Yeah, fair bit. Um, although bearing in mind that Samsung have a 16 terabyte solid state disk, and I think they've announced they've gotten even bigger as well, so. Yeah, solid state disks are where the future is at, but this is progression of the old rotational hard drives. So currently Toshiba's largest disk drive holds 8 terabytes and spins at 7200 RPM. 
although they have no information on the PLAS account or interface, although it's probably going to be SATA. Yeah, I'd expect so. <laughs> Another article from the Register. Energy sector biz hackers are back, badder than ever. And this is about a group called Dragonfly. So the original article came from Symantec. And this is a write-up on a group called Dragonfly. So they maintained a low profile for more than a year following exposure by Symantec and other researchers back in 2014. Before a series of attacks over the last two years since December 2015, the group is blamed by security researchers for the recent attacks on energy companies in Europe and the United States, with sophisticated attempts to control or even sabotage operational systems at energy facilities. So I think this is one of the first documented cases of cyber attacks, well, aimed at United States and European countries. There have been some suspicions before, and there was a case in 2003, wasn't it? The uh, widespread Northeast outage in the United States and Southern Canada. Although I believe that may have been more to do with malware infections hampering communications and preventing shut-off and damage to substations, rather than actual attacks. But, you know, could be wrong there. That could have been cyber attacks back then, but I guess we'll never know the official angle on that. So Symantec doesn't finger Russia in its report, but the US Department of Homeland Defense and Security claimed Dragonfly was a Kremlin op in its report last year. Oh, sure it was. Yeah. (laughs) Presence of both French and Russian language code in the strings malware samples. Honestly, it does mean nothing. It's just... uh, So many things from the United States seem to be blamed on Russia. It's like the Cold War never ended. So these cyber attacks in the energy sector have motives of intelligence gathering and sabotage, and the methods of attack utilised spear phishing emails, trojanised software, and watering hole websites. Guess it's a bit of a different method than the sneaking malware in on a USB stick. Oh wait, who did that? Um, Ah... United States did something like that against Iran. <laughs> oh, so I'm just waffling away on this one. So yeah, I'm, I'll leave a link to this article. Other than it being a documented case of something which I've already suspected of going on, yeah, it's kind of about it really. From SC Magazine, a data breach exposes 4 million Time Warner customer records. This was Time Warner Cable's customer records which were left on Amazon AWS S3 buckets and improperly secured. So yeah, left open to the internet. The information compromised spans the period from November 10th, 2010 to July 7th, 2017 and included transaction numbers, MAC numbers, usernames, account numbers, types of service purchased, along with internal development information like SQL database dumps and code with login credentials. And I believe Time Warner, or who are they called now, Chromtech, have had to notify all affected customers. But don't worry, your information will only be pilfered and taken by scammers, and if your email address is in there, you can expect a deluge of spam. Very nice. So I didn't see anything about date of births being stolen. So yeah, that's always a favourite one. Yeah, don't worry about my credit card number. I can get a new credit card, but can I get a new date of birth? Oh, no, I can't really, can I? From Bleeping Computer, a massive wave of MongoDB ransom attacks makes 26,000 new victims. (laughs) A MongoDB ransacking all over again. I remember this before because the default configuration of MongoDB allows access from the internet. And this is exactly what's happened. It's people who have not secured the databases properly. So what happens? The data is ransacked and encrypted, and then a ransom is demanded. So there's been a few different ransoms demanded here, from 0.2 of Bitcoin down to 0.05 of Bitcoin. I think um, oh, this is sort of roughly around 600 US dollars. The amount of new attacks went down compared to the beginning of the year, but the destructive reach in regards to victims per attack went up in numbers. So it looks like there are fewer attacks, but with larger impact. To put it in perspective, it took attackers in the first wave of MongoDB nearly a month to rack up 45,000 ransom databases. The cruelty group managed half of that in only last week. Yeah, that's um, 
pretty aggressive on the speed, but fair enough, you can just do automated scanning and no doubt you'd find them very quickly. It doesn't take particularly long to do a scan of the IPv4 address range. However, trying to scan the IPv6 address range, that'll take you a long time. I forget the figure off the top of my head, but um, it's uh, certainly in the region of months, isn't it? Um, I'll have to go and look at that, how long it actually takes to scan the whole range. But yeah, it's not something you can do overnight, that's for sure. Another article from the Register, Indian call centre scammers are targeting BT customers. British Telecom, another internet service provider, this is one of the big ISPs in the United Kingdom. So BT customers in the United Kingdom have been targeted by scammers in India, with one person reporting they were defrauded for thousands of pounds this week. The issue appears to have been going on for more than a year. Some customers have said fraudsters knew their personal details. Ooh, I wonder how they got that. Say, doesn't BT use an Indian call centre? Not that I'm saying anything, of course, but it's a hell of a coincidence, isn't it? So a BT customer forum thread entitled Possible Scam has hundreds of comments dating back from last year. One recently wrote they'd been in touch with BT about their broadband prior to receiving a call from an Indian man stating he was calling from BT. He asked me to confirm the postcode and address which he gave to me over the phone and then my date of birth. At that point I said no and he hung up. Clearly a scam call and weirdly never had to call BT until the last few weeks and all of a sudden a call. Yeah, funny enough, if anyone phones you asking to confirm details, no, tell them to sod off, <laughs> get the number for the company, or just look it up on the internet. Another said it had happened to him, adding the caller was very plausible until they wanted remote access to his PC hard drive. Oh, that old scam from India. She even knew my name, address, phone number, and both mine and my husband names, so had access to some of our details, another comment wrote. A BT drone said, BT takes its security of customers' accounts very seriously. Oh, sure you do, sure you do, just like every other company does. We proactively warn our customers to be on their guard against scams. Fraudsters use various methods to glean your personal information or financial details with the ultimate aim of stealing from you. This can include trying to use your BT bill and account number. What? Okay. So, any information about how it got out originally? Don't know. And for this week's stupid news, strange naked woman found in Californian man's bed. Okay, <laughs> and the complaint is? So a Northern Californian man arriving home from work this week discovered a naked woman he did not know asleep in his bed, police said. The saga started on Tuesday when he found a parcel ripped open on the porch of his home. A utility knife that he'd seen inside the home was laying on the porch. The man went inside and found a partly eaten sandwich, an open beer, a pack of cigarettes was missing, and an empty beer bottle sat nearby. He noticed someone had recently showered in the bathroom and strange clothes were strewn around. He told police that he found a woman sleeping in his bed. He woke her up and then called 911. While the man was talking with a police dispatcher, the woman got dressed and wandered out onto the front porch and sat down in the chair. <laughs> As you do, as you do. Okay, well, that was a week of Linux news. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all later.